Well, let's talk about the Mekong River. Um, we basically toured on land for about a week. Uh, all of Vietnam, we went from the north in Heilong Bay all the way down to Ho Chi Minh City. And then we boarded a riverboat for a week of riverboat cruising. Um, it was my first riverboat, my first river cruise. Uh, man, I can't imagine another river cruise as beautiful. And I, I would like to piggyback on what you said about the smells. This truly was a trip where the smells every day were just as powerful as the sights, good or bad. Mm -hmm. Some were really, really good. Some were really, really bad. But this this trip really did hit all the senses. Um, the abject poverty that we saw on the riverbanks, the shacks uh, built on stilts with their raw sewage just being dumped right into the river, um, the fishermen and women. Where the young kids bathe, by the way. Right. The fishermen and the fisherwomen in their sampans throwing nets over. Um, the barges in the middle of the river that were scraping the sand at the bottom because the building boom in Ho Chi Minh City and Saigon is so out of control that they needed more uh, sand for the cement. Uh, the water buffaloes cooling off along with the kids taking their evening bath. We were told that um, they are required to bathe, is their custom to bathe before sun goes down. So usually the kids and the water buffalo would go out together and get their bath. And, and we saw a lot of that. Um, talk about how the river really plays a big part in your book. I mean, it's it the is. name of the book. <laughs> it is, it, the river is, was the way that, um, a village survived. Most of the people on the river's edge were fishermen. And um, some of them had farms as well, but a lot of them were fishermen. And that's where the girls did the uh, washing of their clothes. That's where they got water to cook with. And that's where they got uh, water to feed the animals. Um, and that's where they bathed. So it was, it was uh, they were living on the river. That's what, that's, they needed it. And so this was, you know, the end of the river as for the girls was, you know, the bend was they had to take a, they had to take a turn and they, they had a sharp turn, a 90 degree or 180 degree turn away from the life that they had known. And they were kind of set adrift in a river of, of Saigon where they kind of had to find their way and not drown. And um, they each found their own way during the story. And then their positions changed. And at the end of the story, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you, tell you too much of the story, but um, their positions changed again. And um, so the idea of flowing and having to adjust and having to change and having to be aware of where you've come from and where you're going, um, just like you would on a river, was, was really a metaphor for what happened in the story. Yeah, it was beautiful. So the two largest cities we saw, Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi, were so different from each other. Um, Ho Chi Minh is just a mammoth city. Um, Hanoi was very French. I think we expected that when we got there. Um, but they were equally fascinating to both of us. It's obvious it's a socialist con country, but they have figured out how to work with a capitalist marketplace somehow. Um, there's a lot of Chinese money being pumped in right now, but the building boom uh, was huge. In fact, at Heilong Bay, um, a very quiet area that people go to see the beautiful water and the outcrops of the water. Okay. It was starting to look like Atlantic City. When we were out on the river, uh, I mean the bay, which, I mean, that's also the Gulf of Tonkin, by the way. Right, right. Which is theoretically what started the incident in the Gulf of Tonkin started the Vietnam War, if you believe LDJ, but anyway. Um, yeah, I think it's all because of the Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. 
rich Chinese want to come to Vietnam to get away from China yeah. <laughs> because you know the wealth isn't as spread um, as well as it is in, in Vietnam because Vietnam is such a smaller country. Um, and, I, and remember there was Japanese money in there too. Yeah. Oh yeah. The subway for the Metro and, and that was in Hanoi, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And we did still see that poverty level in the cities. And I think the thing we took the most pictures of were the women on their bicycles, uh, hawking their fruits and vegetables and flowers. The women with the flowers were just so beautiful. And like you said, the women sitting in the street over a hot plate making pho. Um, they're very interesting. What I um, tried to get in, but I, I, it would have been, it was tough to get it in for a couple of reasons. I read a bunch of interviews with bar girls in Saigon. And the bar girls said this was the best thing that could ever have happened to them. Not only did they make a lot of money, but the U.S. soldiers treated them with respect. They were polite. They weren't uh, horrible as, quote, Vietnam men were thought to be. And most of the women had stories about being abused by their brothers, their fathers, their husbands. And they, would, they said they would never go back. To a Vietnamese man. They love love these soldiers no matter how they were treated because um, how, no matter what they did with them, and some girls did and some girls didn't. I mean, it, it was their choice whether they wanted to take their relationship farther. Um, but they didn't have to to be a bar girl. You just had to be a hostess and kind of um, and and they said that this was the first time that women were treated like women that were, were and they loved it and they just wow. a lot of them really really wanted to come to the u.s afterwards well conversely the rural areas of the country were just as amazing while we were on that riverboat um each morning we usually did a little dock docking and visit uh some of the small villages which i'm sure were the inspiration for the book um we saw the woman sitting cross-legged on her porch weaving the um nala the yeah. the, Vietnam, the vietnamese conical hats um we saw the man who was hand making sampans i think it was one a day it could have been one a week i'm i'm i i can not one a day okay one a day um both of them made it into the book yes <laughs> um the village school that we stopped at where i mean it looked just like Little House on the Prairie, just no walls on the, everybody was in the same big room. Um, the chickens and the bar, other barnyard animals that actually lived underneath the houses. Uh, again, the smells of these villages. Um, so tell us then, how did you bring the rural Vietnam into the book? Well, I, I mentioned to you that the sampan maker is, is definitely in the book. And so is the woman who does the nun laws because um, she was very industrious. And then um, I, we saw a chicken fight when we were walking. And that makes it into the book, too, because I had never seen a real chicken fight before. And that comes in at a different place. Um, and the, um, we also saw, you know, what, did, what was the liqueur that you were drinking, the wine? Oh, my gosh, the snake wine. wine. It was... Right, right. Not about the snake wine. <laughs> yeah, I did that in too, but I didn't find a place for that. But um, the rural, the rural elements, you know, I tried to get in when I could. There, there was a whole part of Vietnam that unfortunately we did not see, and I think it's worth a trip to go back. Mm -hmm. And that was the Central Highlands, which are supposed to be so beautiful with mist curling around the edges of yeah. the um, and Dalat, we never went to, which is where Tum spends a lot of her time after the army, after the after the Kuchi tunnels, which has it's a beautiful moderate space place in Vietnam. Um, it's at the foothill, it's on the foothills of the Central Highlands, and they grow beautiful fruit and vegetables. And it's the temperature is more moderate, and so <laughs> I'd love to go back. And then there's also um, Tainin, which I'm I'm probably butchering the pronunciation 
of, which is the seat for the Kaodai religion. And that became, that we didn't hear too much about it on our trip, but I had heard about Cal Dai, and it's, it is a Vietnamese religion, and it's a very interesting religion because it tries to blend the best of Christianity and Islam and, and Buddhism and even a little Hinduism into one. And it, it's, it's, you know, um, what do I want to say? It's like... Um, 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 I know what you want to say. <laughs> the place in Chicago. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Mm, I hate it. Okay, yes. <laughs> and, um, That's what I thought of as I was reading that part of the book. It does sound very, very similar, but it's indigenous to Vietnam. It's, it's the only religion that's kind of indigenous to Vietnam. And um, it was very popular. And the interesting thing is that it got politicized. As, and at one point during the um, French occupation when uh, Ben Phu, when, when they were trying to get the French out, they wanted the Cao Dais to be on their side. The South wanted the Cao Dais to be on their side, but then they thought the Cao Dai people were army. They even raised an army. The Cao Dais were getting too much power and Diem. Diem uh, then kind of banished them and they went back to their little city um, outside Saigon or a, a lot, a lot really almost close to the Cambodian border. And um, there was always some intrigue with the Cao Dais. Were they, were they pro-North or were they pro-South? And, and that's where I could get into a little bit of the um, uh, spying, you know, uh, okay. espionage aspect because that, that actually happened. Okay. Well, finally, I want to talk about the heat. I don't think we've ever felt heat like we felt on that trip. Um, we were there in March for the pretty much the whole month of March. We even asked one of our cab drivers about the heat, and he told us that there were three seasons, hot, hotter, and hottest. And we were in hotter, that it was actually going to get worse after we left. Um, Right off the bat, you talk about the heat in chapter one. You write, the hottest part of the year was approaching and the combination of summer heat and the monsoons would produce an indolent lethargy that made even washing clothes a burden. It was perfect. Um, many afternoons we sat in our little lounge chair on the uh, deck of the riverboat with the ceiling fans going and a drink in hand and our clothes were just completely wet. <laughs> there was no point in washing them. So as a right, I haven't really asked you about your writing technique, um, but how do you make those smells and feelings and tastes come alive in your writing like you do? All sensory. It's all finding uh, an analogy or a sensory kind of thing that brings them out. You can't do justice to the smells. It's probably the hardest thing to, um, but you can talk about how the smell made the person feel, you know, whether that, that made him want to run away or, or come closer or, or something like that. Um, but the heat was, was another thing that was really hard um, to really um, process because we have no, as Americans, we have no real way of comparing it. Now, interestingly, I got, uh, you know, I've got advanced reviews and a fellow just reviewed the book and he said I was wrong and that March was the hottest time of the year because, you know, uh, because the monsoons would come in June and July. Well, what about April and May? You know, I, right. I, I think he was a little... He wanted to nitpick, you know, yeah. because it really, they, everyone you and I talked to said, oh, it's going to get even hotter than this. Right, right. Yeah. One day, and, I was so hot, I couldn't go to see, uh, I had to come back to the boat. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to know, we were told October is the perfect time to go, so. Where <laughs> is your month in Vietnam? <laughs> Next time, we'll go in October. <laughs> Well, that's all I have. Thank you so much. This has been fun reliving this trip. It really was a trip of a lifetime. And like I said, I wouldn't mind going back for a week or 10 days to see what we missed. Yeah. The, 
I think I'd stay longer though that flight. Whew. Yeah. Or well, we stop. Maybe go someplace else. We'll have to figure it out. I don't know. I'm ready. Well, as soon as the the COVID is over, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure I really want to go to China, but um, Japan's a possibility. That's true. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. You can see the cover of the book behind me. That's the poster that I made. So the book will be out in uh, officially in October. But um, if you're really nice, we might be able to arrange for for your, some of your uh, legal scholars to get uh, an advanced reading copy. Okay. All right. And and if you do want to just put a plug, the the artwork on the cover was based on a beautiful piece of art that you purchased while in Ho Chi Minh City, right? Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I found out I I was pursuing the rights to that because you know. I needed to hear that. I did do that. I did lawyers. I did all those rights. And I found out some very interesting things, which I will tell you about, about oh. later. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. See you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.